I spoke to the Finance Minister just before we came to air and started by asking him how he slept ahead of this historic budget. Oh, yeah, no, I got a good night's sleep in last night. Um, we'd, we'd finally put the, the documents for the budget to bed and I woke up this morning feeling, you know, that this was a very important day for New Zealand and, and I'm really proud of the budget we've been able to deliver in, in what were pretty extraordinary circumstances. So how different is the budget you delivered from the one that you had previously imagined? Very different, um, in large part because we have a $15 billion further response in terms of our COVID recovery and rebuild that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And that's, you know, that's a big sum of money, but actually it's you know, a part of our ongoing response. Um, there were some things that, that we weren't able to go ahead with as a result of having to shift gears, but we also did invest in those core uh, public services and health and education and so on. So you know, I think we've got the balance right in this budget between looking after the things we need to for government services, but responding to support New Zealanders uh, to get through and thrive at the end of COVID-19. Let's get to some of the specifics. So the wage subsidy scheme, an extra eight weeks relief, um, but that is subsistence for some of these businesses. They've got rent and overheads. What other long-term support will there be? Well, obviously, at the moment, there's support for many of these firms through the Small Business Cash Flow Scheme, which is specifically designed to be able to deal with fixed costs, and many, many businesses are signing up to that. Uh, in addition, alongside the wage subsidy scheme, if we're, say, talking about the tourism sector, that's why we've put in our first instalment of money into the tourism recovery plan, $400 million, to start supporting those businesses to transition, to reorientate their business, to make sure we secure tourism assets, because we we recognise in a sector like tourism, it isn't going to go back to normal, in fact, any time soon, if at all. And so we've got to be alongside the industry and those businesses, helping them to adjust, helping them to get into that domestic tourism market. And so, you know, we've got a package there that I think is the beginning of our work with the tourism industry. When it comes to retail and hospitality, this extension is aimed at them, and they are able to trade as we move into level two, and then in, we hope to level one as soon as possible. So that $3.2 billion, is it capped or could it go higher? Look, I think you've seen all the way through this that we've been really flexible about the kind of contributions we'll make. You know, when we first started the wage subsidy scheme, it had a cap. We removed that cap. We've changed conditions as we've gone. Even with this scheme, we've brought in startups who weren't eligible for the original scheme. So we continue to adapt and develop, um, but we think this is a really important extension to help businesses who actually, and many of whom in the targeted sectors, are not even able to trade at this point. But you're not ruling out that that figure, $3.2 billion, could be pushed out higher if needed. Oh, look, I've, I've learned over the last two months to, to avoid ruling too many things out. One, one important thing to note, Lisa, is that $3.2 is an estimate. What we pay out on for the wage subsidy scheme is if you meet the criteria. And if you'll recall, at the beginning, when we had the initial wage subsidy scheme, we said it would be a range between $8 and $12 billion. So they're not targets, they're not limits, it's just the estimate for the number of people we think will be helping through the scheme. You're holding $20 billion in reserve, not saying what you're going to spend it on at the moment. So could you use that for cash payments later on, maybe at level one, so that people have got money in their back pocket to help stimulate the economy? Yeah, look, the, the whole point in leaving $20 billion on the table is to be flexible. Every country around the world is in a situation where we haven't seen the full story of COVID-19 play out. And so we wanted to be able, we think it's the responsible thing to do, to be able to take some time to make those decisions. As I said, you know, it's, it's the rolling mall of initiatives. Our, our economic response to COVID-19 happens every day, not just budget day. So it does give us the flexibility to respond. We certainly are aware of the fact that, you know, stimulus in the economy will be important. Actually, the wage subsidy extension will, will be part of that. So will a number of other initiatives. But we continue to work on what we can do to support households through this. Yeah, but people listening are going to want to know, is there something else coming for them? So can you tell them either way whether that is still on the table, this idea of a lump sum paid out to households? Yeah, look, I mean, we, we're taking a look at a range of options. The thing about is that, that is it them? is obviously quite an untargeted one. 
Well, it's, it's certainly been an option. I've said that for, for several weeks now. It's an option that we are considering. But what I was about to say was that as we move down the alert levels, our focus is naturally more on targeting those who are the most affected. But we certainly recognise that people, particularly those who are losing their jobs and people who perhaps have reduced hours, are vulnerable, and we're going to make sure we continue to support them. Those decisions will be made as we go, just as we have been for the last eight weeks. So $1.4 billion on trades and apprenticeships. Which ones are going to be free? Are they going to be on-the-job training or will it be through institutions? A mix of both. And in terms of the industries we're focusing on, it's construction, it's manufacturing, it's actually community and health care. It's making sure that the areas where we know we have some skill deficits, where we know we're going to need more people, that we get alongside those industries and support them. I mean, construction's a really interesting example, Lisa. When you look at what happened at the end of the global financial crisis, people lost their apprenticeships. They didn't get into the, those areas. And so when we did come back, and there was a recovery, we had a skills shortage. We're just not going to let that happen again. And, and if you just let me to add one um, other thing to that package, there's an important component here which is actually to pay the equivalent of the wage subsidy to employers to keep their apprentices on board, because that was another legacy of the global financial crisis. The first people laid off in businesses were often the apprentices, perhaps two years through a four-year apprenticeship. We are now going to be providing direct financial support to businesses to keep their apprentices on. 11,000 jobs in environment, killing wallabies, cutting wilding pines and pulling up weeds. Are you worried that we're stepping back into a low-wage economy with these jobs? Look, I think it's important we have a range of different uh, employment opportunities for people. Uh, these are things that will make a big difference to our environment and actually to our productivity. Um, in many cases, people can get into the job quickly without having to be retrained, which means they've got an income, they've got skills. And so actually, you know, these are important things for us to do. Some will be temporary, others will actually be permanent jobs. And, you know, roles like fencing up our waterways to keep our rivers clean, uh, making sure that we actually have functional tracks and huts in our our Docker state. These are really worthwhile things to do and people can get into the work quickly. All of this comes at a cost, right? So the debt forecast is going to more than double from around well, just under 20% of GDP to more than 50%. How are we going to pay that back and how long will it take? Well, what the budget shows is if, if with the 10-year projections that, that Treasury do, that we'll be reducing it down um, to around about 40% um, over that 10-year period. That's because the economy will be growing, and we're confident with the investments we're making that we will be reducing that debt over time. New Zealand always has debt, Lisa, so we don't actually pay off and get to zero. Michael Cullen did pretty well at getting close to that, but for the most part of our history, we have always had some debt to help finance what we do. But we do want to get ourselves back to a more sustainable fiscal position. But I've been very clear today, I'm not prepared to do that and sacrifice the livelihoods of New Zealanders as we go through it. Um, you and I both lived through that in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, there is a better way than that, and it's about investing in our economy to grow it sustainably to be able to reduce that debt. understand that, but we are going to have to pay some of that down. So are you going to revisit tax? Look, we aren't focusing on tax at the moment. Um, our focus is on investing in people through this budget. Um, in the future, we'll be looking at options around what we do with debt reduction, but our first and best place of doing that is to grow our economy, which means as a percentage, debt will be lower. Uh, and it's about getting a balance right in terms of doing that. We've shown we can be fiscally disciplined, but in the end, there's no point in saving for a rainy day if you're not prepared to put the umbrella up when it happens. I know that growing the economy is one of the solutions, but at the moment you've got a closed border. Immigration was one of the big factors that fuelled our growth. You're not getting those people in there. We've got a number of low-wage jobs that have been created as a result of this. Your tax take is going to be down. So can we expect austerity at some point to pay down some of this debt? I just don't believe in that, Lisa. I, I've seen the damage that that does to communities. We have to be careful with our spending, and we've been careful as we've gone through the last couple of years. We have to be disciplined about making sure we, we invested in the right places, and I think in this budget we're doing things 
that will create high wage jobs and in the infrastructure area and construction and the digital sector um, and the agri-tech sector. We're putting money into those areas as well. But I think the damage we do to a society through austerity policies far outweighs the fact that we're carrying this debt. And bear in mind, the debt that we're now creating will still mean that we will have among the lowest levels of debt in the OECD. That's uh, the legacy of what this government has done and what previous governments have done. And it means that we're better positioned than many, many other countries when it comes to debt. And that was the Finance Minister, Grant Robertson.